1. Millennial Perspectives There have been many important analyses of premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism from an exegetical perspective, that is, in terms of a careful analysis of the relevant biblical texts. Notable among these are O.D. Ellis, Prophecy in the Church, and L. Budner, The Millennium. It is our purpose to analyse these three positions from the perspective of biblical theology. What are their theological implications? To begin with, it must be noted that there is no neutrality on my part as I make this analysis. The ideal of neutrality is a myth. All men speak and write from a given perspective. We see things and organise knowledge in terms of a fundamental perspective, commitment and faith. Our perspective is always conditioned by our religious presuppositions. There is a religious difference between these three perspectives on the question of the millennium. A Christian cannot hold that all three positions are legitimate and valid for Christians. Either one is biblical and the others are not, or none are. The question of fidelity to Scripture cannot be a matter of indifference. Once we adopt a position, it has certain logical consequences and also very practical implications for our lives. If I believe that Christ will soon rapture me from this evil world, this will have a practical effect on my life very different from a belief that I shall see the world get worse and worse and live through a fearful tribulation. Again, if I believe that the world will see the progressive triumph of Christ's people until the whole world is Christian and a glorious material and spiritual era unfolds, I will be motivated very much differently from either a premillennial or an amillennial believer. Thus, we cannot hold that these differing doctrines of eschatology are a matter of indifference. They make a very great difference in how we view the world and our work and future in it. There are said to be at least 40 million Christians in the United States who profess to believe that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. If these people believe that the end is near and the rapture at hand, their impact on the world is very different from that of 40 million who believe that they shall conquer the world. In the one situation, people are preparing to conquer the world and to assert the crown rights of King Jesus. The contrast is even greater when we consider the promises of Isaiah concerning a world relatively free of crime, at peace, and men having a long life expectancy, and we recognise that we are called to proclaim the saving power of Jesus Christ to all men and to prepare our hearts lives and communities for his reign in and through us. The impetus for Christian action is then very great. The kind of faith we have governs the whole of our lives and our total outlook. How we view God and Christ will determine how we view ourselves, our calling and the end times. Our view of the end of eschatology depends to a large measure on our view of the beginning and of all history and on our doctrine of God and of salvation. Theology is a seamless garment, and a man's views of the end times is inseparable from his view of God. If he changes his mind on the one, he changes his mind on the other. With this in mind, let us examine the varying perspectives, and, first of all, premillennialism, in particular the dispensational premillennial view. Virtually all premillennialists are dispensationalists, This perspective was made prominent in recent years by the Plymouth Brethren in England under the leadership of the Reverend John Darby, circa 1830. It gained its most widespread influence through the Schofield Reference Bible, edited by the Reverend C.I. Schofield. The Schofield Reference Bible gives introductions, section headings and extensive notes which interpret the whole of Scripture in terms of this dispensational premillennial perspective. Schofield held that there are seven dispensations, eras or ages of history in which God had a particular revelation and a particular way of life for each, so that the value of scriptures given in that era is essentially restricted to it. These dispensations are, first, innocence, the period in Eden from the creation of Adam and Eve to their fall. The second era is that of conscience from the fall to the flood. The third dispensation is that of human government, 
from the flood to the call of Abraham. The fourth is that of promise, from the call of Abraham to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. The fifth dispensation is that of law, from the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, through most of the public ministry of Jesus Christ. The sixth is that of grace, from the closing days of the ministry of Christ to the second coming to rapture the saints. Some forms of premillennialism have more than one coming of Christ. The seventh dispensation is the kingdom, the millennium, a thousand-year period during which Christ reigns on earth. Other dispensationalists have other ideas of dispensations. Blackstone in Jesus is Coming had seven also. Innocence, Freedom, Government, Pilgrim, Israel, Mystery and Manifestation. Still other dispensationalists, however, will not even agree on the number. Some have as few as four, and others as many as eight dispensations. That there should be a difference of opinion about what should be so obvious, that is, differing plans of salvation, is revealing. No such clearly marked dispensations occur in Scripture. Yet these dispensations are held to be totally different aspects of God's dealing with men, so that certain portions of Scripture are held to be essentially valid only for a certain era of history. The extreme dispensationalist will hold that, while the Old Testament is the inspired Word of God, it has next to nothing to do with our religious life today. Only a few types and symbols are relevant, so that the premillennial teacher, quote, minds, end quote, the Old Testament for, quote unquote, gleanings for our time. The major portion is gone as far as relevance is concerned. But this is not all. Much of the New Testament, strict dispensationalists hold, has nothing to do with our world today. It is for the, quote, kingdom age, end quote. God has no absolute and unchanging word for them. For many, only a very limited number of pages in the New Testament are valid for the, quote, age of grace, end quote, the sixth dispensation, so that many end up with a shorter Bible than most modernists. To cite a specific example, one dispensationalist in an Anglican church refused to use either the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come, or the reading of the Ten Commandments as prescribed by the Book of Common Prayer, because he held that these had nothing to do with the, quote, Age of Grace, end quote, but referred to the, quote, Kingdom Age, end quote. Dispensationalism limits the Bible and its relevance. It wrongly divides the word of truth. It denies the wholeness of Scripture, and the fact that God does not change, nor does his law, nor his plan of salvation, change from age to age. Many dispensationalists in preaching from Moses, Exodus through Deuteronomy, will bypass the plain requirements of the law to spend hours and chapters on the supposed symbolism of the colours of the tabernacle furnishings. The plain and literal meaning of the law is disregarded for fanciful and allegorical interpretations. They do not read the meaning out of Scripture, but rather read a meaning into Scripture. Premillennialism existed as a heresy in the Church, rising and falling in various eras, long before John Darby. In every era, it had a strong tendency towards an evolutionary view of God and religion, thereby betraying its non-biblical origins. Thus, the medieval millenarian, the abbot Joachim of Flora, held that three ages exist. First, the age of the Father, the age of law, vengeance, justice, the Old Testament, and the Hebrews. Second, the age of the Son, the age of grace, faith, the Church, the New Testament, and the missionary expansion of the faith. And third, the age of the Spirit, the age in which grace and faith give way to love, the highest way, and in which the world's religions and nations unite in love in a world beyond law and grace. Some forms of this doctrine see the Third Age as the death of God and of the Son, Era. An evolutionary view of religion and of God is basic to such thinking. The rise of evolutionary faith in science led to a greater stress on a particular interpretation common to many but not all premillennialists. This is the, quote, gap theory, end quote, very strongly affirmed by Schofield. Supposedly, between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, the, quote, 
original, end quote, creation of the world, and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the supposed recreation of the world, a great gap of time, thousands and perhaps millions of years in length, occurs. During this time, according to Schofield, Earth had undergone a cataclysmic change as a result of a divine judgment. The face of the Earth bears everywhere the marks of such a catastrophe. There are not wanting intimations which connect it with a previous testing and fall of angels. The same position was affirmed, a little more mildly, by the Pilgrim edition of the Holy Bible, 1948, in its introduction to Genesis, which began by stating, The beginning for this earth may have been countless ages ago. As a result of this interpretation, such dispensationalists hold that modern geology offers no problems for them. The gap theory can accommodate millions of years and make room for the geological epochs. Not surprisingly, it becomes easy for premillennial, fundamentalistic teachers of science to affirm a position which is an accommodation to evolution, trying to unite creationism and evolution. The American Scientific Affiliation, ASA, formed mainly by science instructors and professors in fundamentalistic colleges, is very hostile to six-day creationism and strongly favourable to accommodationism. Not all premillennialists are given to accommodationism, as witness Whitcomb and Morris, the Genesis Flood, and Bolton Davidheiser's Evolution and Christian Faith. But all too many are accommodationists, especially if they accept the Scofielian system and the gap theory, which these latter men do not. According to Scripture, the plain declaration of God is, I am the Lord, I change not. However, according to the dispensationalists, he has changed, and repeatedly so. He has accommodated himself to early man and later man, at varying plans of salvation, and has had a varying revelation. Not only have evangelicals who are prone to dispensationalism and or premillennialism been too prone to accommodations with evolution, but also to leftist political ideologies. Having denied God's law, they have no settled and fixed words by which to judge all things. Good intentions carry weight with people who lack a law foundation, and the world of socialism, like hell, is paved with, quote, good, end quote, intentions. Moreover, the emphasis in premillennialism is not on the kingdom of God, but on an essentially Jewish kingdom and empire, on the kind of thinking St. Paul called Jewish fables. Other aspects of the Jewish fables which the Church adopted include works of supererogation, which is a belief that the merits of Abraham and other saints were so great that they were sufficient to save all Jews to the end of time. An appeal to Father Abraham would mean the application of his excess merits to the account of the appealer. In the book of Maccabees we encounter prayers for the dead. This and other aspects of Phariseeism crept into the Christian church, and with premillennialism at least one aspect of Phariseeism has been revived. Non-dispensational premillennialists, while breaking with the Scofelian system, are still latent or implicit dispensationalists, in that they do divide history in terms of the second coming, the rapture, the thousand-year reign by Christ as the Jewish king of the whole earth, and then the end of the world, and they do posit a different kind of word and law from one era to another. Scripture gives us one unchanging law of God. It tells us that the second coming and the end of the world coincide. It does not give us a world which moves from law to grace and then back to law. In every era, law and grace are operative and unchanging. In theory, the amillennial position holds that there is a parallel development of good and evil, of God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. In reality, amillennialism holds that the major area of growth and power is in Satan's kingdom, because the world is seen as progressively falling away to Satan, the church's trials and tribulations increasing, and the end of the world finding the church lonely and sorely beset. There is no such thing as a millennium or a triumph of Christ and his kingdom in history. The role of the saints is at best to grin and bear it, and more likely to be victims and martyrs. The world will go from bad to worse in this pessimistic viewpoint. 
the Christian must retreat from the world of action in the realization that there is no hope for this world, no worldwide victory of Christ's cause, nor world peace and righteousness. The law of God is irrelevant because there is no plan of conquest, no plan of triumph in Christ's name and power. At best, God's law is a plan for private morality, not for men and nations in their every aspect. Not surprisingly, amillennialism produces a retreating and crabbed outlook, a church in which men have no thought of victory, but only of endless nitpicking about trifles. It produces a Phariseeism of men who believe that they are the elect in a world headed for hell, a select elite who must withdraw from the futility of the world around them. It produces what can be called an Orthodox Pharisee's church, wherein failure is a mark of election. Lest this seem an exaggeration, one small denomination has a habit of regarding pastors who produce growth in their congregations with some suspicion, because it is openly held by many pastors that growth is a mark of compromise, whereas incompetence and failure are marks of election. A millennial pastors within this church regularly insist that success surely means compromise, and their failures are a mark of purity and election. Not surprisingly, postmillennialists cannot long remain in this basically and almost exclusively a millennial church. Let us now examine some common traits of a millennialism and premillennialism. First, both regard attempts to build a Christian society or to further Christian reconstruction as either futile or wrong. If God has decreed that the world's future is one of a downward spiral, then indeed Christian reconstruction is futile. As a prominent premillennial pastor and radio preacher, the Reverend J. Vernon McGee declared in the early 1950s, You don't polish brass on a sinking ship. If the world is a sinking ship, then efforts to eliminate prostitution, crime or any kind of social evil and to expect the Christian conquest of the social order are indeed futile. It must be noted, however, that it was such premillennial opinions that united with Unitarianism in the early 1800s to replace Christian schools with state schools so that the Church could retreat to a minimal program, revivalism. This points clearly to a second common aspect of these two positions, the limitation of the Christian task to soul-saving, to snatching brands from the burning. Scripture is stripped of its total message and reduced to a soul-saving manual. Matters of law, respecting crime, the use of the land, money, wits, property, diet, civil government and all things else are set aside to concentrate on soul-saving only. If now Christian schools are started by some of these groups, too often their essential purpose is to further soul-saving. Conversion clearly is important. So is the alphabet. We do not learn the alphabet to spend our lives majoring in the alphabet, but in order to read, learn and grow. Conversion is the alphabets of Christian faith, whereby the whole word of God's calling and law are opened up to us. Have we learned to read if we get no further than the alphabet and its repetition? Are we converted if we do not move beyond the conversion experience, and if not, Is that experience then real? Life means growth, not paralysis. And true conversion is a beginning of life and growth. Third, neither premillennialists nor amillennialists pay much attention to the creation mandate, and premillennialism, under the Reverend Carl McIntyre's leadership, is falling into the heresy of denying it. But our Lord said, Occupy till I come. Luke chapter 19, verse 13. God created man to exercise dominion over the earth and to subdue all things in terms of God's law word, and Jesus Christ restored man, as himself the last Adam, into this mandate with the blessed assurance that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. The Christian's duty and calling is to exercise the crown rights of King Jesus in every area of life. Although amillennialism gives formal adherence to the creation mandate, this is simply a tradition in terms of its reformed ancestry. 
the adherence is formal and meaningless, because amillennialism, having affirmed the certainty of decline and defeat, cannot very effectively assert a call to dominion. Fourth, both amillennialism and premillennialism are in varying degrees antinomian. They bypass the law entirely, or reduce it to merely personal morality. They fail to see the relevance of God's law as the way of sanctification and as the law of men and nations. They do not recognize God's law as God's plan for dominion, for godly authority and rule in every area of life. This anti-law attitude guarantees impotence and defeat to all churches who hold it. They may prosper as converts or retreats from the world, but never as a conquering army for God. Fifth, there is an implicit Manichaeanism in premillennialism and in amillennialism. The material world is surrendered to Satan, and the spiritual world is reserved to God. In recent years, as our Chalcedon reports have passed from hand to hand, one of the responses from premillennialists and amillennialists is to send a flood of their literature to me, to convert me, and also to write, sometimes anonymously, on what a terrible thing it is to encourage people towards Christian reconstruction. Some have boldly stated that the world belongs to Satan, and they are vehement in their hostility to any challenge against this idea. They fall into a form of Satanism, ascribing to Satan this world and all things therein. This is not Christianity, it is Manichaeanism. It is more than heresy. It is apostasy. Sixth, since the world is surrendered to the devil, the role of the church, as we have already indicated, is to be not only a soul-saving agency, but also a convent, a retreat from the horrible world around us. Protestants have long criticised the idea of monasticism, but under the influence of these two millennial views, Protestantism has turned the whole church into a retreat from the world, minus only sacerdotal celibacy. Men are summoned to withdraw from the world into the church. Nothing is said of establishing the reign and rule of God in every area of life, thought and action. Seventh, as we have indicated, these views hold to a fundamental disunity of Scripture, a sundering of the Word of God. God was defeated in his plan for dominion through man when Adam fell. Christ restored man, but only to a kind of conventual life, not to dominion. Such scriptures as Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 are referred to as the kingdom age by premillennialists and thus made irrelevant to Christian action today or spiritualized into meaninglessness by the amillennialists. Turning now to postmillennialism, we must say that very definitely, because it sees salvation as victory and health in time and eternity, it sees therefore a responsibility of the man of God for the whole of life. Postmillennialism holds that the prophecies of Isaiah and of all Scripture shall be fulfilled. Scripture is not divided. It is not made irrelevant to history. There shall be, as Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, Romans chapter 16 verse 20, and Revelation chapter 12 verses 9 and 11, declare victory over Satan. And as Genesis chapter 13, Genesis chapter 28 verse 14, Romans chapter 4 verse 13, and the whole of Scripture proclaims, All the families of the earth shall be blessed. People out of every tongue, tribe, and nation shall be converted, and the word of God shall prevail and rule in every part of the earth. There is therefore a necessity for action and an assurance of victory. The historic creeds of the Church have been postmillennial in the main. For example, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 8, section 8, reads, To all those for whom Christ hath purchased redemption, he doth certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same, making intercession for them, and revealing unto them, in and by the word, the mysteries of salvation, effectually persuading them by his Spirit to believe and obey, and governing their hearts by his word and spirit, overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power and wisdom, in such manner and ways as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation. The larger catechism gives us a like emphasis. Question 54. How is Christ exalted in this sitting at the right hand of God? Answer. 
Christ is exalted in his sitting at the right hand of God, in that, as God-man, he is advanced to the highest favour with God the Father, with all fullness of joy, glory and power over all things in heaven and earth, and doth gather and defend his church, and subdue their enemies, furnisheth his ministers and people with gifts and graces, and maketh intercession for them. Question 191. What do we pray for in the second petition? Answer. In the second petition, which is, Thy kingdom come, acknowledging ourselves and all mankind to be, by nature, under the dominion of sin and Satan, we pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed, the gospel propagated throughout the world, the Jews called, the fullness of the Gentiles brought in, the church furnished with all gospel officers and ordinances, purged from corruption, continence and maintained by the civil magistrate, that the ordinances of Christ may be purely dispensed and made effectual to the converting of those that are yet in their sins, and the confirming, comforting, and building up of those that are already converted, that Christ would rule in our hearts here and hasten the time of his second coming, and our reigning with him forever, and that he would be pleased so to exercise the kingdom of his power in all the world as may best conduce to these ends. The postmillennial view, while seeing rises and falls in history, sees it moving to the triumph of the people of Christ, the church triumphant from pole to pole, the government of the whole world by the law of God, and then, after a long and glorious reign of peace, the second coming and the end of the world. This view holds, first of all, very obviously to the unity of Scripture. All of Scripture teaches one way of salvation. All of Scripture has one mandate for man. All of Scripture teaches that man is under the one abiding law of God. We have one calling, one unchanging God, one unbroken word. Second, postmillennialism makes clear that Christians not only have a task of soul saving, but also of school, home, church, business, state, vocation saving, a calling to bring everything into captivity to Christ the King. Third, postmillennialism restores the law to its place as a way of sanctification and a plan for conquest. Fourth, postmillennialism takes seriously the Lordship of Christ. He is not only head of the church, but the King of kings and Lord of lords. This means that he is ruler of all nations and Lord over all authorities in every area, and all things are to be put under Christ in time as well as eternity. The impact of the church as it confronted Rome, as it confronted the barbarians, and again at the Reformation, was to conquer, to subdue kingdoms to the Christ of Scripture, and to his infallible law word. The reformers were men of the world. Luther, a professor first and last. Calvin, a lawyer theologian called in to reform Geneva by the city council. Reformation means to proclaim the saving power of Christ and to apply the whole word of God to every area of life. Anything short of that is not the gospel. Gospel. 